Hi class, now we're going to consider um, our last major application of the WKB method uh, and that's to apply the WKB method to uh, study the Schrodinger equation. So here's the time-independent Schrodinger equation, um, which I've written here, minus h bar squared over 2m times the second derivative of the wave function plus the potential times the wave function is equal to e times the wave function. This is the equation we have to satisfy for a stationary state of this time independent to get a solution of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. I can re-massage um, this into the following form, h squared over h bar squared over 2me times the second derivative is equal to v over x, v over e minus 1, which I'll call minus q, times psi. So this looks like what we would need for the WKB approximation, where we identify the coefficient here, h bar squared over 2me, with the small parameter epsilon squared. We expect the WKB method is good in the limit epsilon goes to 0 plus, so we expect to be able to use the WKB method to analyze solutions of the Schrodinger equation in the semi-classical regime where the energy E is large. What we'll see, actually, is that the WKB method gives surprisingly accurate results even for relatively low energies. For example, for the harmonic oscillator, the semi-classical approximation will actually give us exact results, which is unusual. So, now we can use uh, the WKB method with this value of minus q. So the value of s0 of x is plus or minus the integral of the square root of v over e minus 1 with respect to dx prime. And s1 is minus a quarter of the log of that quantity, v over e minus 1. Remember, for the WKB approximation to be valid, it's not sufficient just for s1 to be small, or epsilon s1 to be small compared to s0, but it, uh, it actually has to be small in and of itself. If we look at this, however, we see that the criterion that s0 is much greater than s1 is going to fail if v over e minus 1 goes to 0. Because if v over e minus 1 goes to 0, the logarithm of 0 is a large number. It's you know, formally infinity. So the WKB approximation fails when the value of the potential equals the energy. Here's what that means graphically. If we plot our, here's, um, our, our, uh, here's uh, the energy axis. Here's the spatial axis x, and we have our potential v, which is plotted here as some random curve. And here's the value of the energy e that we're interested in. There's a point, x star, where the energy equals v. This is the classical turning point. If a particle has total energy e, then to the left of x star it moves, and it comes to the turning point x, x star. It feels a negative, it, its potential, sorry, its kinetic energy goes to zero. It feels a negative force and it moves to back to the left, it bounces back. So that's why it's called the turning point. Uh, quantum mechanically, if we have a wave function psi, what we expect is in the allowed region, we have an oscillatory solution. But in the forbidden region, in general, we're going to have a non-zero but decaying exponential solution. So the, the WKB approximation should be valid way out here, where we're far away from the turning point, either uh, on the right, or out here, where we're far away from the turning point to the left. Um, but it's going to break down right at this region where x is approximately equal to, uh, to x star, so right near the turning point. What we'd like to do is we're going to drive a connection formula. If we know we have a decaying exponential in the forbidden region far to the right, we'd like to understand the properties of the oscillatory solution in the allowed region far to the left. We want to connect the behavior of the solution in the forbidden region where it's exponentially decaying to the behavior in the allowed region where it's sinusoidal. So what we're deriving are called the connection formula for the WKB approximation. So here's the equation we want to solve. Epsilon squared y double prime is minus q of x times y. Um, we're going to choose to move the turning point so it happens at x equals 0. Um, if minus q is much greater than 0, we're in the forbidden region. If minus q of x is equal to 0, that's the turning point. For q of x much less than 0, that's the allowed region. We're going to solve this equation in three regions. We're going to solve it in region 1, where x is much greater than 0, using the WKB approximation. We're going to solve it in region 3, where x is much less than 0, using the WKB approximation. And we're going to match by matching region 1 to region 2 and region 3 to region 2 in the region x equals 0 by solving, by approximating the potential v over e minus e, and, uh, v over e minus 1 in particular, as a linear function near the turning point. So we're going to make an approximation that q prime uh, 0 is greater than 0, as just shown here, uh, and that, uh, they're, uh, that near enough to the turning point, we can treat the potential as though it's a linear uh, uh, potential causing a constant force. 
In region one, uh, we can just use the WKV method directly, and we know we have an exponentially decaying solution, so we don't, the, the other solution in the WKV approximation, the exponential of plus one over epsilon times the integral is irrelevant, and the only solution is this one. This is our solution. Um, the zero is here, here for the lower endpoint is taken for convenience. We can redefine that by redefining what we mean by the constant C. Now, in region two, we approximate minus q of x by this linear function a times x. So this is the equation we get, epsilon squared d squared y dx squared equals axy. I'm going to rescale x, just like we did in boundary layer theory. Um, in some sense, the, the region near x equals 0 is sort of the boundary layer in this case, and I'm going to try to analyze that, solute, that behavior separately. I'm going to rescale x in terms of t by capital A times t. So this is the equation in terms of t. If I set epsilon squared over a squared equal to a times a, I get a dimensionless equation, d squared y by dt squared equals t times y. So this is the area equation. Um, and in order to match, we need to know things about the solutions of the area equation, uh, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, but this uh, scaling tells us the relationship between x and t. Now, we know that we're interested in the solution that exponentially decays at large t. If you look at our previous lectures, you'll see that of the two independent solutions of the area equation, there's ai of x and bi, uh, sorry, ai of t and bi of t. ai of t is specifically uh, the solution to the area equation that vanishes in the, uh, that goes, goes to zero exponentially as the argument goes to zero. bi of t is the one that grows exponentially. So physically, we know that in uh, region 2, the solution that we need is actually some constant times the first area function, a i of t, which written in terms of x is like this. Now to match, we do the same kind of thing we did in boundary layer theory. The limit as we go to the right at far distances in the scaled variable t, so the limit as t goes to plus infinity of the solution in region 2, should match the solution in region 1 as x goes to 0. Um, we've actually solved for, I, I mentioned that a, a i of t is defined as the solution which asymptotically at large t goes like this, which if I rewrite t in terms of x, I get this behavior. If I take x going to 0 instead, the controlling um, thing, uh, the controlling function in the expo exponent is uh, the integral of uh, minus q of x prime, that should be dx prime. Uh, I guess I can actually erase it, dx prime. Uh, so in the region, if x is small enough, I'm approximating that by a linear function. That's 2 thirds a to the 1 half x to the 3 halves. So as y, goes, uh, as y in region 1, as x goes to 0, goes like c times this function, ax to the minus a quarter, times the exponential that we've just evaluated, minus 2 thirds a to the 1 half x to the 3 halves. Now, um, uh, over epsilon. Now you'll notice something interesting uh, 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 right away. Uh, the form in the exponent, minus 2 thirds a to the 1 half over epsilon, x to the 3 halves. When you work out the 3 halves power of this, the epsilon to the minus 2 thirds becomes the epsilon 1 over epsilon. The epsilon to the 1 third becomes, sorry, a to the 1 third times the 3 halves becomes a to the 1 half. And the minus 2 thirds matches. So we can see we're on the right track because the form of the expo exponent is actually the same and it's possible for the behavior of the area function a uh, in, uh, of the function in region two to match the behavior of the function in region one, uh, the overall prefactor works up to the overall constant. We ha we need to relate the constant c to the constant d, and if you go through the algebra, you'll see this is the relationship between uh, the the solution capital D in region two to the solution uh, in terms of uh, the area function in region. Uh, sorry, C is the coefficient in region 1, D is the coefficient in the area function region, region 2. Now, we can do the same thing in region 3. In region 3, we're in the allowed region. The solutions are uh, oscillatory functions, so we can write as exponentials e to the i over epsilon times the integral, e to the minus i over epsilon times the integral, and I've chosen this form of, uh, of, remember, we're in the allowed region, so x is a, a value typically less than uh, 0. Uh, in the allowed region, so that's why I've chosen to write the integrals this way. The uh, overall endpoints just re mean redefining the coefficients capital F and capital G. To match, we need to match the solution in region 2 as we go to negative infinity to the left. 
to the solution in region 3 as we go to 0 from the, uh, to the negative side. This is easy enough to evaluate from here, and we need to rely on um, the definitions of the area function ai. If you want, we need to know something specific about the solutions of the area function, which I'm just taking uh, for granted and quoting to you. But um, the, the particular solution ai of t, as t goes to negative infinity, has this form. It's a sinusoidal function, so that matches the exponential. And you, as you'll see, for the same reasons as on the last time, the argument uh, actually agrees in this region. And so does the form of the, of the, of the overall uh, uh, of function multiplying the sine. Now, what we need to do is match um, to find uh, f and g in terms of the equation in region 2, in terms of uh, d. And since this is a sign, not surprisingly, you're going to get a sign. And when you do the matching, what you find is that, that the coefficient capital C, which we introduced on the far right side in the forbidden region, um, appears as the overall factor in region 3, the, uh, the allowed side, and this is the wave function in the allowed side of region, uh, of region 3. So here's the connection formula. We start with the form of the area equation, um, which is valid, which has exponentially decaying solutions in the forbidden region. This is the general form of the, uh, of the WKB solution to the Schrodinger equation. We've chosen a coefficient 1, uh, to, to normalize our coefficient in the forbidden region on the far right. And now when we match through the turning point to the oscillatory solution, all that happens is the coefficient 1 here becomes a coefficient 2, and we get a sine uh, instead of uh, an exponential. To control the errors, we always connect from the exponentially damped solution into the oscillatory region. And if we start with the oscillatory region, if we're off by a very little bit, we could in principle reinduce something that's exponentially growing. And so this tells us how to connect from the exponentially decaying region to the oscillating region. Now, we can do something very interesting with this. We can actually get a formula for semi-classical quantization. Here's the idea. Suppose I have a potential v uh, which uh, increases both to the right and to the left. And I'd like to understand if it's possible for it to have a bound state of energy E. What does a bound state mean? Well, it means that I have exponentially decaying solutions on both sides and an oscillating region in between. But I can use my connection formula either to go from region A, where I have an exponentially decaying solution, to region B, where I have an oscillatory solution, or I can go from, from region C into region B. And what, it, what happens in between has to agree. That gives me an additional condition. So let's see what happens. If I connect from region A to region B, then I use the connection formula, and in general, in region B, I see that this is the form of my solution. This just looks like this term here, where I've applied the solution uh, in, the, in, the, in the allowed region. Notice that I go from uh, here, x0 is the turning point on the right-hand side, x1 is the turning point on the left-hand side, so this integral goes from x to x0. If I go from region C to region B, I get exactly the same thing, but the argument of my sign changes. Instead of being from x to x0, which is from here out to the right turning point, instead I get the integral from x1 to x0 from the left turning point to the, the region that I'm interested in. Now, both of these things have to be true. In order for them both to be true, it had better be true that, that this solution is proportional to this solution. Well, the overall prefactor agrees, which means that the arguments of the sign have to be related. If I think about the integral which appears in my first matching, the integral from x to x0, I can write that as the integral from x1 to x0 all the way across my allowed region from x1 to x, uh, from x1 to x0 minus the integral from x1 to x. So I can write the argument of the sign that I get uh, by my first matching formula, this one, I can write this way. I can write it as uh, a constant, which I'll analyze in a minute, minus the argument of the second solution. If this constant is just n times pi, the sign of the whole argument on the right-hand side is n times pi, which is minus 1 to the n, of minus the argument that I needed uh, uh, when I match from the left-hand side, which is to say, if this constant has a property which is equal to n times pi, then these two 
solutions are consistent with one another, the wave functions I get, either matching from the left or the right, agree up to an overall factor. So the only way that I can have a bound state, where a bound state means I have an exponentially decaying solution on both sides that satisfies the, the Schrodinger equation with an oscillatory equation in between, the only way that I can, uh, that I can get a, uh, a, 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 that solution is instead to, uh, to have this integral, 1 over epsilon, the integral from x1 to x0 of square root of q dx prime plus pi over 2 to be equal to n pi. That is, uh, rewriting it in turn, rewriting in terms of what epsilon is, you see that I have this, the condition that I've just written here. You ha I have the equation that the integral from x1 to x0, the square root of 2m, of e minus v of x prime dx prime, has to be an odd integral multiple of h bar pi. That tells me that not any old value, for a given value of the potential v, a given functional form of v, not any old energy will work. Instead, I'm going to have quantized energy levels. In fact, I'm going to have an infinite number of them indexed by an integer n. And this is the semi-classical quantization condition. Uh, that's described in greater detail in Bender and Orsag or in various quantum mechanics books you may have seen. Uh, if you apply this for the harmonic oscillator potential, you actually get the exact harmonic oscillator wave functions, but you can apply this to almost any uh, potential and you get reasonable approximations for the energy levels themselves.